Bibles, uh, Acts chapter 8. This evening, and we have reached uh, verse 26. We like to go through God's Word um, section by section as it's been given to us. As the topics come up, as God has given them to us, we seek to preach them and be faithful to that. And we're going to read uh, from verse number 26 of Acts chapter 8. And just before we do that, let's uh, pray briefly. Father, we ask that your word would be our rule, uh, your spirit would be our guide, and your glory would be our supreme concern. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began with this scripture. Beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Aztus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And we're reading at the end of the chapter. When someone um, asks me uh, from time to time about preaching, as people do, uh, about what I think makes good preaching, uh, or if I have any tips about preaching, I don't know why they ask me about that, but, uh, but if they ask me that, I, I have this explanation in my mind that I, that I like to use. And it's the image of a car. And the car is, uh, is driving down the road, and, uh, and the question is, who is driving? Who is at the wheel of the car? Uh, And what you want is the Holy Spirit who who breathed out these words of Scripture in the driving seat. That's good preaching. You don't want the preacher, uh, the man in the pulpit driving. No, that would be his ideas, uh, his priorities, his direction. He he can explain, of course. He he can be in another seat uh, teaching, explaining, illustrating, showing, exhorting, applying to to others under his care what the Holy Spirit is saying, but he's not in the driving seat. What you want is the Holy Spirit at the wheel. That's good preaching. He, He gave the word of God. He breathed it out, and he works through the word of God. What he has in mind is what he has in mind in this passage of Scripture, whatever it is. Uh, And that is the same message since these words were written and given to the original audience of of God's people. Otherwise, otherwise if if you use the Word of God to say whatever you want to say as the preacher, it's like it's like taking hold of the steering wheel. And by doing that you you do damage. You, you do violence, you, you abuse even the Word of God. I choose my words carefully. You, you quench the Spirit in His work by doing that. But if that is true 
in preaching a sermon from a text of Scripture, that is also true in all of life for the Christian. You want the Holy Spirit not just to fill you as a Christian, but also to to steer you, to to, to guide you, to, to be in charge of the direction of your journey to the promised land as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You get the idea. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. But how are we led by the Spirit of God, you ask? Is there a voice, his voice? Are there, are there impressions uh, placed on us that we should listen to as we go about our lives? Is that how it works? Stand in that, that queue, uh, turn left here, cross the street now, uh, choose that brand of cornflakes. I, I don't know. You, is that how it works? Or is there another way uh, to consider what Paul means by being led by the Spirit? Tonight, firstly, we see uh, leading uh, from God. Uh, Philip has been, has been evangelizing in Samaria, remember? Uh, and things have been going rather well there. Uh, he's seen plenty of, of conversions. God's been at work by his grace. Uh, not Simon, as we saw last time, but plenty of others that God has gloriously and, and wondrously saved. The apostles Peter and John have been up to Samaria to assess things. Uh, they, they've brought the gift of the Spirit upon the believers in Samaria for the very first time. And we saw that this was not a normative thing, but a one-off as the gospel spread out from Jerusalem for the first time and into Samaria. And another one-off, we read in verse 26, that an angel of the Lord comes to speak to Philip. Now, we know that angels are God's messengers. Uh, he, he is uh, an angel of the Lord. Well, we, but we can, we can sort of get used to, to this sort of stuff in Acts, can't we? Where, where we see things and we hear about things that, that were happening, people being healed and uh, on demand by the apostles and demons being cast out. And, uh, but but these, are, these are special days. These are not things that are normative today. Philip hears instructions from an angel. That's not normative. He hears instructions from heaven here and now in this passage. And like Abraham of old, he, it involves travel, get up and go. And he's to go south, we're told, uh, on the road from Jerusalem uh, to Gaza. Now, we know where Gaza is these days, of course, due to the horrors of what's going on there. It's on the, it's on the western side of, of Israel at the sea. Uh, this, is, uh, this is New Gaza. Uh, it's, in, it's in ruins today, but, but old Gaza was a city that was destroyed about 100 years before that, at the time of the Acts, um, 100, 100 years before the time of Acts, and that's where Philip's being directed. It was one of five mainly Philistine cities on the road from Jerusalem, the main road from Jerusalem down towards Egypt. It went through the ruins of old Gaza. There were two roads from Jerusalem to Gaza. Philip the evangelist is sent on the desert one the one last traveled, the quiet one. This angel is, think about it, directing Philip the evangelist away from the crowds of Samaria. This angel is directing Philip the evangelist to the desert road with hardly anybody on it. Strange that, isn't it? But Philip, being an obedient servant of God, he obeys. It, it, it's, a, it's a few days journey from where he is to get to there. He's been up in Samaria, but that's what God wants. He's been sharing the gospel with the masses in Samaria, but he knows that God knows best, so he listens to his instructions, and he rises and he goes. For there's a man here that he needs to meet, a man who needs to hear. This man's not from Israel or Samaria. He's from Ethiopia. Now, that's a word that refers, well, not necessarily to the country of Ethiopia that we know of it as today, but more the whole area of the eastern side of Africa, south of Egypt. That's Ethiopia in the biblical kind of time, what we might call Sudan or Kenya, even Somalia today, uh, South Sudan as well, those kind of areas. This is an African man who has an important rule. Uh, he's an official in the court of Candace. He's high up in the ruling regime of Candace. Candace is a word like Pharaoh. Uh, it goes from one queen to the next. 
Uh, and so Candace is the uh, leader of, of Ethiopia, and he's in charge of her treasury. We might call him the finance minister. We might call him the chancellor. And he is a seeker. Despite his importance, his prestige, his power, his good job, he knows something's missing. There's, a, there's an emptiness about his soul, and it's caused him to travel to look about it. He's been in Jerusalem, and he's been seeking, presumably during Passover or Pentecost or both. Uh, he's uh, probably a Gentile, we think, what the Bible sometimes calls a God-fearer. He is a eunuch, a word that refers to him being emasculated, as all the men in the room grimace. That's a common enough practice in ancient uh, Sudan for those set apart for royal service. But because of this, while in Jerusalem, he would have been barred from any, uh, any, in any case, from, from being at the inner courts of the temple. Even if he was a Jew, he wouldn't have been allowed. He was excluded from that. And having been to Jerusalem, he's left the same way with emptiness, the same way he arrived. And, and he's on his way back home. But he has a couple of big advantages over most people. He, he has a chariot for the journey. Yes, but, but the important ones, the important advantages are that he has a copy of some or most or all of the Old Testament in his possession, and he can read two big advantages. He's got a copy of some of the Old Testament in his possession, and he can read. In those days, uh, you read out loud. Imagine that on the bus or train for everyone with a book or a smartphone. Chaos. In fact, in a world where concentrating is very difficult, that's where you and I live, okay, I, I recommend reading your Bible out loud at home even, because if it's God speaking, after all, in this book of ours, it's, it's more important than in whatever else is going on, and if that's what it takes to concentrate, I, I find reading my Bible out loud helps me, maybe that'll help you to concentrate. Philip is making his way along the desert road, and then verse 29, the Spirit, we read, said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. What spirit is this? It's the Holy Spirit, of course. Uh, the spirit who, uh, Philip, uh, who, who dwells in Philip uh, communicates like this to him. And, and, and it's put in a really rather matter-of-fact way, isn't it? It just says it there, black and white. The spirit said to Philip. How does he say this to him? Did, did, did he speak audibly? Was it a voice? Was it an impression, an inclination that Philip had? We can't be sure. We're not told. If it was an impression or an inclination that enters Philip's mind, we can say that it was from the Holy Spirit because the Bible tells us with certainty that it was from the Holy Spirit as the gospel begins to spread. This is like later in Acts chapter 13 when we read about Paul and Barnabas being set, being sent on the first missionary journey to Cyprus. And this is what we read. Uh, wh while they, uh, that's the church in Antioch, uh, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Also in Acts 16, uh, on the second missionary journey, Paul and his companions, including Luke, uh, are forbidden by the Holy Spirit from speaking the word of God in Asia to the east, uh, and then they're trying to go to Bithynia in the northeast, and, they're prevented, and they end up going west from Troas, and the gospel enters Macedonia and essentially continental Europe for the first time. The Spirit guides them. And Philip, he doesn't waste any time here. The chariot is moving fairly swiftly, so he has to run up to run to, to catch it, we're told in verse 30. But he has to do it. He's got to speak to this man. We so often feel helpless, uh, you and I. Uh, we, we can, what, what can I do? It's what we think. With so many that people that surround me in, in school, in work, in my journey to work, in my golf club, in my craft club, I, I'm so outnumbered. What am I among so many of them? I'm so outnumbered. And we think that what we need is maybe a big campaign with a big reach on, on a YouTube channel or something to, to reach all these people. But, but let's do what happens here and reduce this down to individuals. Individuals 
you come across or know who you can speak with and, and direct and, and reach. Who is, who's one person that you could do that to, I wonder? To Philip, this um, individual didn't seem that obvious in his significance. But we, of course, now can see the importance of this man. Because aside from everyone being important and being made in God's image, this man can go home and share the message with a whole other continent. And he will. But Philip didn't know that. He just shared the gospel with a man on the road and that he didn't know, but because God led him to. Second, tonight we see the teaching of Philip. God leads him to this man, and then we see the teaching of Philip. This man is reading out loud, as we saw, uh, and Philip hears him, and he recognizes the passage. Uh, it's a passage that Philip uh, knows. It's a passage that Christians know well. I'm pretty sure you know where it's found, and it's a most appropriate passage. The man, this man can read. This man has the word of God in his possession, a private copy. That, that's very rare, by the way. This is very, very expensive. There's no um, evangelical bookshop in uh, Jerusalem in these days. It's very, very expensive. But it's vital here. Philip asks him if he understands. God's word is not a book of spells or magic words. It does not work to just read it. It has to be understood, God's word. That's important. Now, there's a great barrier to our understanding. In fact, there's two, two great barriers to our understanding. Number one, we're born dead spiritually, all of us. And number two, we need a preacher or explainer. We're dead spiritually. How do you know someone's dead uh, physically? They're, um, they're unresponsive, aren't they? That's how you know. Uh, you could, you know, shout at them, you could sort of, you know, hit them across the face, try to get them roused, but you could shake them, it doesn't matter what you do, they're not going to respond. Dead people can't respond to any physical stimulus, they can't. If they're asleep, they would awake, but they're not. That, that's physically dead people. Spiritually dead people, it's the same idea. Spiritually dead people can't respond to any spiritual stimulus. And God the Spirit, he's given us these words. You see what I'm saying? And secondly, you need a preacher or explainer. Romans 10, verse 14 and 15 says, How then will they call in him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. And praise God, the Ethiopian official has both of these things, the solution to both. And they both come by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is at work in bringing him to spiritual life, and he's been at work in sending a preacher with beautiful feet to bring the gospel called Philip. That's what's going on here. He has the words given by the Spirit in his possession already. He has the Scriptures. Now he has the Spirit in work, at work in him and Philip to explain the Word of God to him. God's Word in your hands is, of course, is of course still God's Word, but you usually need help too. Now, of course, it's possible to read God's Word on your own and come to saving knowledge. That's, I wouldn't want to limit God for sure, and that's absolutely happened before, but it's far more normal to need help, far more normal. You can hear the gospel by reading your Bible, but it's far, far more normal that you need someone to explain it to you, someone who understands already, someone with the Spirit. The answer to Philip's question, do you understand what you're reading, shows us this, doesn't it? Verse 31, what's the answer? Do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, how can I, unless someone guides me? How can I? And he invites Philip up into the chariot to sit up nice and high in the chariot, lovely chariot, and he, and he wants him to read the Bible with him. I wonder if you ever asked someone if they'd like to read the Bible with you. You say, oh, I don't think I could do that. Some people would respond to that idea far easier than coming along to a Sunday service or a Good Friday event at Easter. 
people have, uh, can testify to that. I'm quite sure someone you know needs a guide. Be creative, be willing. There's more than one way to reach people, of course. We ought to be creative about that. There's some books in our church library actually called Bible One-to-One that, that help with this. You can read through John's gospel with someone. It gives you help to do that. Christ will give you all you need for this. This man is no dozer. Okay, he, He's got a good job, yet he needs someone to explain it to him. And that someone is Philip, who happens to be walking that way. No, he doesn't. <laughs> And the passage just happens to be the most obvious pointer to Jesus Christ atoning death on the cross in the whole Old Testament. Put yourself in this um, Ethiopian man's sandals for a minute, will you? Try to imagine these words that we're about to read coming at you in a book and you not knowing what it's about. Okay, let's try it. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? What's it it about? You've just read it. You've never heard about it before. What's it about? Someone has died, it seems. He's been slaughtered. He's been been denied justice, hasn't he? It's, It's humiliating for him. Uh, he, he's killed without even putting up a protest, it seems. He hasn't even opened his mouth. He's killed. He's been taken away from the earth. He's dead. Who's it about? This man doesn't understand if this, this, if this passage is about Isaiah himself, who penned these words 700 years before, or if it's about somebody else. He doesn't know. Now, he's not stupid, remember, because these things are spiritually discerned. Worked out, understood. He needs the light of the Spirit to see this. He needs help. Philip opens his mouth with help. And we're told, beginning here, that he told him the good news about Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53, which is where this is from, is not about Isaiah himself. It's about the suffering servant. It's about God's coming Messiah, his king. That's what it's about. This is about the suffering of innocent Jesus who died not that long ago in this time frame and and let it all happen to him for for gospel good. That's what it's about. Philip explains to him that that's that's what this this passage is about and and what it's, by the way, always been about and always will be about and it's not what it means to him or what it might mean to him or or what it could mean to somebody else, but what it's about. (laughs) That's what it is. Because the Holy Spirit wrote it through the pen of Isaiah. And he's in the driving seat. Are you with me? And he does this with what we know to be Isaiah 53. And also with lots of other Old Testament passages too. And they consistently do the same thing. They they point to Jesus. That's what the Old Testament does. That they're ultimately about Jesus. In fact, Jesus talks this way himself on the road to Emmaus. In in Luke 24, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted interpreted to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's what he's doing with these two men, possibly a man and a woman, but two people on the road to Emmaus. The Spirit breathed out the word of God. The Spirit works and speaks through the word of God. They go together, word and spirit. And so when Philip uh, leads, uh, Philip, Philip led by the Spirit goes to speak to this man, he, he needs to bring the Word of God out so that God can speak to this man by his Spirit, so that he will come to life spiritually, understand the words of Scripture, respond and believe. And he does. Praise God, he does. He believes the gospel, and so he becomes a Christian. God offers him salvation, even though he's a probably a Gentile eunuch from Ethiopia, because, of course, this is the Old Testament message of Isaiah. Listen to this. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. 
I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And also, of course, in Isaiah 11, in that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, which is Ethiopia, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. Of course, he can be part of God's people as an Ethiopian eunuch. Finally, we see obedience of the believer. Leading of the believer. Leading of the believer. That this man repents of his sins. He accepts the gift of grace that salvation is. And clearly he's been told by Philip that Christians are baptized. How else would he know this? And so they just so happened to be passing by at the last watering stop for the uh, horses or camels before the desert. And so in his first act of obedience as a believer, well, Second, if you include repentance, he sees this water. It just so happens to be there. <laughs> and he asked the, his third important question of the meeting, verse 36. See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? He knows that the Christian obeys Christ and obeys the Holy Spirit in the words of God's commandments. And so he knows Christians get baptized. So he does. Baptizo, that's the word here for, for bap, baptize. It, it, it's a word that means to dip, like a tea bag is dipped. That's the, that's the word. Uh, and so after they get the chariot to stop, Philip and him go down into the water. You're not, um, you'll, you'll forgive me for being a Baptist at this passage, but it's fairly clear to me. Uh, the word is down. It's not beside the water, uh, as, is, as, is, as in splashed on him or something. Uh, it, it's the word for descend. It's down. And then after this, they come back up out of the water. You'll notice that as well. And then immediately, surprise. Because Philip, well, he disappears. He's carried away, we're told, by the same Spirit of God to Astos which is a, a town known as Ashdod in the Old Testament. Let's get the map back up again. We'll see this. He's carried all the way to Aztos from somewhere on that red road towards the, the bottom circle. It's Philip's journey, that red road from Jerusalem down towards Gaza. He ends up at Aztos. This is, again, a strange apostolic era miracle. God whisks Philip away, probably 10 miles, something like that, up the coast, and he's... It sounds like it's instantaneous here. He has more people for him to meet, we're told, in villages along the coast to hear the gospel, all the way up to Caesarea, which is way up there, uh, the coast. And the eunuch is left with Christian joy. He's rejoicing in his Savior, isn't he? He's going to share this with a whole continent. There are some abnormal not repeated things in, in Acts in, in this today, isn't there? Angels speaking to Philip. That's, that's not normal. Uh, we've got Philip being lifted from one place and dropped off in another. That's not normal. But how does the Spirit guide us normatively in the Christian life? Let's ask that. God, of course, is God. Uh, he can do as he wishes. But what can you and I expect? If every Christian has the experience of being led by God, led by the Spirit as we are, it's only natural to ask how are Christians led by the Spirit today? What we, what we find, as I've, as I've already alluded to, is that the Word of God and the Spirit of God go together. That's the case here in Acts chapter 8. And always, God leads his people by his spirit in his word. And, and listen to uh, Psalm 143, verse 10. What's, what's God's will? What's his, how will he lead me? Teach me to do your will, we read. For you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. No, notice in this verse that the psalmist doesn't here encourage us to find God's will. People sometimes talk like that. He assumes it's already known, and it's something that needs to be taught. <laughs> it's not something that needs to be performed. Do your will, not know your will. Notice that. Teach me, and do 
It's not show me, it's teach me to do your will. So we need God's word. We, we need um, not less or, or snippets. We need God's word in our minds. We need to be familiar with God's word. We need to know the words and the way God works in his word and what he cares about and what his priorities are. But that's important. For unlike uh, psychic Fiona Stewart-Williams, we're not uh, mystics. We're not. And the Bible is not a book of spells. As my father would say, you'd be better putting the 20-pound note in the fire, for at least it would heat the house. That's how much a ticket is to see uh, Fiona Stewart-Williams and Donald and May, the psychic. I used to be a bit like this, to be honest with you. Uh, to, to look uh, for God to give me inclinations or, or prompts for things that I was wondering about, decisions I was making that were, I'll use a word, like non-moral decisions, you know, like I use that word because there are things that are very obvious uh, in the Bible that, 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 that we know what to do with morally. Should I push this woman out of the way and take the last seat on the bus? Of course not. Should I beat my wife? Of course not. Should I, uh, only, should I join only fans? Of course not. Should I steal the office stationery? Of course not. But there are, there are clear commands on those things. But what about all the other things, the, the non-moral kind of questions or, or, or decisions we have to make? I, I used to look for verses uh, and ask what they meant to me here and now. I remember going to a man with this verse that I had in the Psalms, and I, and I said to him, you know, God has given me this verse. Uh, what, what does it mean for me now? And uh, Which I meant by that. Uh, what, what sh how does this direct me in, in my life right now with what, what's going on? And, but we need to make God-honoring choices. Now, I do think there are times when the Spirit does prompt us or nudge us, uh, I don't know, go and speak to that person or help this person out. But I do think also it's impossible to know this with certainty. So hear me, hear me clearly on that. It's possible that for the Holy Spirit who indwells us to, to sort of it prompt us to do something, but I don't think you could know that with certainty. So you should be very careful with that because you, you would test it with God's word, but how could you test it with God's word if it's something... You see, you see what I'm saying? But you see, of course, with Philip's situation, clearly the Spirit did speak to him, so we do know that that's, this is what, what's happened. With you and I, we, we wouldn't know that. Here we know it's the Spirit because the Bible says it's the Spirit. But we wouldn't know that. We might suspect it. We might have the impression that this is an impression from God, but we, we're best not to, I don't know, authoritatively look at it like that. Best to leave it in the kind of unknown, but rather in non-moral decision-making, it would be better to seek to develop what someone has called sanctified reasoning. I think that's helpful. In other words, you'd be better spending your time rather than looking for inclinations or uh, seeking to, for verses that are not what they're about or going through your Bible and finding a verse. You'd be better looking to develop character and Bible knowledge and learning from others in church that makes you someone who's led by the Spirit because you know your Bible and you know how God works and you know God and what he cares about better. Someone who knows their Bible knows the principles that come again and again and can come as close as possible to what God would say because the Spirit and the Word go together. So sanctified reasoning is much better. Because, of course, with sanctified reasoning, you would know that people are to be salt and light. So, of course, they would share their faith with this stranger that you've just met. Of course you would. <laughs> or people who are led by the Spirit, uh, they, they, they behave like Jesus. So, of course, if you have an opportunity presented before you to do good, you would do it. Because <laughs> that's what Jesus would do. You would help that woman who's fallen over. Of course you would. You would, you would share your story in the gospel with that man next to you on the flight for an hour and a half because that's what Christians would do. Sanctified reasoning would teach you that. You pray about changing job or, uh, and, and, and you, you really do say, you know, God, I, I, I'll do either as you wish. 
and, and maybe you would, I don't know, set a deadline and, and, and based on whatever uh, you, you decided at that deadline, you would, you, would, you would prayerfully do that. Maybe you would pray about asking that girl for a coffee and, and wait to see. God guides his people by the Spirit. And those who are well acquainted with God are well acquainted with God's word and can make sanctified good choices. That's as good as we got, and that's enough. God guides his people by his spirit. And so we seek again to be people of the book. We seek again to be filled by the spirit. We seek to be his wise people here and now in the lives that we live before us. Let's pray, shall we?